These are the mountains of northern Shan Sea. Here, for thousands of years, the poorest of the poor have etched a life from the land they call the Yellow Earth. Here, the dream of a China free and great took on human form, because in this wild landscape, Chinese communism took root. It flowered into a red victory, which transformed the Middle Kingdom at last into a world power. It's the Spring Festival, Chinese New Year, the ancient ritual celebration of the Ansai drummers. They dance for strength and fertility, but in the famine of the 1920s, one in three died. The peasants were helpless against constant war, banditry, drought and debt. A British traveler described a nest of plunderers lost in a wilderness. To this distant place came a ragged band of desperate people. Later, they built this meeting hall and hung it about with their red flags. They were led by a mysterious pair of rebels whose names were the stuff of legend, Zhu De and Mao Zedong. There was a soldier called me over saying, come here, you rascal. I said, what do you want? He said, are you scared of the Red Army? I said, no. He said, not scared of the Red Army. Their leader's called Zhu Mao. Oh dear, I didn't know who on earth Zhu Mao was. He said, Zhu Mao has big fangs sticking out and red hair. He sits in a sedan chair carried by eight men. And he eats two children every day. Not big ones, not small ones. Children just like you. Mr. Zhang soon learned the facts. Mao Zedong was a thinker and talented political organizer. Zhu De was a brave and experienced soldier. Two leaders, one cause. It was defeat at the hands of their sworn enemies, the Chinese nationalists, that forced the remnants of the Red Army to northern Shanxi. The Reds fled from their southern base in October 1934. It took one year and 6,000 miles. They had walked all the way. Only one in three of the marchers made it, but the horror was transformed into the epic moral victory of the Long March. Among the survivors, Zhang Qingyi. We marched all day and all night. There were aeroplanes droning over our heads. They were up above the mountains, dropping bombs on us and spraying us with machine gun fire. That was the hardest part. Another was the fact that there were so many mountains, all covered in snow. You cross one and there's two more. You cross them and there's another one. Too many mountains. After we climbed over the snowy mountains, we had to cross the marshlands. At night we looked for higher ground. It was drier there and that's where we slept. When day broke, we got up and carried on marching. We had nothing at all to eat. There were wild chives growing on the higher ground where there was no water. We used to use our bayonets to dig them up with and then eat them. Just a couple of mouthfuls and then we'd start off again. After we crossed the marshlands, oh, the soles of our feet were all bleeding. That was the survivors. Other men, they just fell down and died. 
Mr. Wun's leader, Mao Zedong, wrote a poem. The Red Army fears not the trials of the long march and thinks nothing of a thousand mountains and rivers. Yan'an in northern Shanxi, the town where the Reds set up their base in 1936. They had their own documentary film unit. The southerner Mao was filmed sharing ideas with the northern peasants. Their accents would have been mutually incomprehensible. Red Yan'an faced many difficulties. For China was at war. Japan took the great southern port of Guangzhou in October 1938. All through the 1930s, Japan's limitless ambition had bitten chunks out of China. Now Japan had a million men in occupation. They demanded surrender. The Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, never wavered. He was sure the West would eventually stop Japan. For him, the key to China's survival was to defeat the communists. His view horrified many young Chinese. They longed for a patriotic united front, communists and nationalists against Japan. Radical students like Su Fei set off on their own long march. We got dressed up like two women looking for our husbands and set off from Kunming. Later on, we changed into nurses' uniforms and traveled by lorry. When our lorry arrived in Yan'an, it was autumn harvest time. There were lots of people with spades on their backs carrying their crops, big pumpkins and things. In our hearts we felt very happy, because young people never think about what might happen later. This yellow earth, it was so vast, and there were so many mountains, one after the other. In Yan'an, if you stood in the middle of a road, there wasn't another road to be seen anywhere. Just the mountains, nothing else, just the mountains. We didn't know we'd got to Yan'an until we saw a city wall. The words on it said, build the United Front to resist Japan. After a couple of days, we took an entrance exam and were enrolled into the anti-Japanese university. We learned party policy, party organization, Red Army history and philosophy, and Leninism too. Amongst our teachers, two were outstanding. One of them was Mao. Mao taught philosophy in a very lively way. When Mao was teaching us, not just at the university, he was always the same. He was able to pass on his knowledge and to stir us at the same time. His reasoning was easy to understand. He'd gesture, he'd move about. Sometimes he'd get up and stretch out his hand, or point to the side, or put his arms behind his back. Very lively. When heaven is about to confer great office on any man, say the scholars, it first exercises his mind with suffering and his sinews and bones with toil. Mao was 45. His beloved first wife, Yang Kai Hui, was a communist martyr, tortured and executed by the nationalists. His second wife, Herzhe Zhen, survived the long march and gave birth to their baby on the way. Many patriotic young women made the journey to Yan'an. They cut their hair and dressed as soldiers. They hacked their cave houses out of the soft yellow earth. Among them in 1939 was an actress from the Shanghai film industry, Chang Ching. The new Madame Mao was his companion during the 10 long years of waiting for a communist victory. The traditional caves where they lived were austere but practical. The home where Chang Ching and Mao worked is preserved as a museum. 
Even during mealtimes, Chairman Mao would be thinking. His mind was always on something. So when we all ate together, Jiang Qing would put the food in his bowl. Chairman Mao liked eating chilies and soya beans, fried green chilies, and she'd pick them out for him. She looked after him very well. But because of Chairman Mao's work habits and lifestyle, I could see it was very hard for her to take as a wife. Chairman Mao was always surrounded by bodyguards, security guards, personal secretaries and so on. A wife had no role to play. I always thought it wasn't like the rest of us couples. Our private lives were full of love and affection. But the chairman simply had no time for that. Later, Mao wrote, Nothing is hard in this world if you dare to scale the heights. By 1941, Japan ran vast areas of China. The nationalist government had retreated to Chongqing, way up the Yangtze River. Not far enough to escape Japanese bombardment. Newsreels pictured Madame Chiang Kai-shek ministering to the wounded. Her perfect English and her beauty were winning foreign friends for China. In theory, the nationalists were now in alliance with the communists against Japan. This collapsed for good in 1941. Chiang Kai-shek took revenge. Red Yan'an was under sustained and bloody attack from the Japanese. Kill all, burn all, destroy all, they said. Chang's blockade added hunger and inflation to the communists' troubles. So here to the valley of Naniwan came red soldiers of the 359th Brigade to dig the wilderness with their bare hands. Among them, the long marcher, Wun Jungxiang. We arrived here in this valley and looked around. There were no caves, no fields. All we could see was a vast expanse of scrub. There was this big bell in Ninjing. When we brought it back here, the blacksmiths broke it into pieces. They made pickaxes for us all to dig the land with. When we were opening up the land, we'd go up the mountain as soon as the cock crowed. When the sun was up, we waited for the moon, and only when the moon was high in the sky would we pack up and come back. The crops they raised helped to feed Yan'an, but the economic blockade had political consequences too. For Mao and the party headquarters, hard times must be met by hard thinking. They clamped down on party discipline. Self-criticism, thought reform, political correctness, all were demanded in the so-called rectification campaign, which began here in 1942. <coughs> Cure the sickness to save the patient, Mao argued. Chin Chuan was an enthusiastic participant. I was very active at the time. I led a unit of 300 people, and we saved a lot of spies. There were these false communists, you see. We were afraid they were spies. We had to save them. So we started our rescue campaign. For example, if I thought you'd done something wrong, I'd try to rescue you, make you admit your mistakes. Have you ever been a member of the Nationalist Party or Youth League? Have you ever been a spy? Have you ever worked for the other side? Questions like that. The campaign went on for nine days. Thinking about it, those nine days were terrifying. People were arrested, arrested. 
put in prison. Chairman Mao held a big meeting in the 8th Route Army Hall. He called all the comrades who'd come under attack to attend. Chairman Mao took off his hat. He bowed, and then he said, Comrades, you have suffered. I'm sorry. This whole thing has got out of control, and it was a mistake. Just think of the party as your father, and yourselves as his children. If a father hits his child, the child shouldn't resent his father for the rest of his life. It was a mistake. We ask you all to forgive us. At that moment, people sitting below started to cry. They were very moved. It's not as if it had been easy for these comrades, myself included, to get to Yan'an to join the revolution. And suddenly to be branded counter-revolutionaries or bad people, well, it was a very difficult thing to take. It was 1942. Madame Chiang Kai-shek went to America. Her address to the US Congress was a huge hit. God damn it, one congressman said, Madame Chiang had me on the verge of bursting into tears. We in China, like you, want a better world. Not for ourselves alone, but for all mankind. And we must have it. Allied airmen risked their lives to supply Chiang Kai-shek across the Himalayas. Allied officers trained Chinese men. It was glamorous and expensive. By the time the Allies sat down together in Cairo in December 1943, the cracks were showing. Churchill thought the China campaign was a waste of money and men. Madam didn't like the interpreter. She reinterpreted everything, said to or by her husband. President Roosevelt was worried about China's lack of democracy, and his top general nicknamed Chang the peanut. In Yan'an, the communists hoped to benefit from this American disillusion. Mao now controlled an area of 54 million people. He needed modern weapons to defend them. In July 1944, he and Judah greeted their first official visitors from America, the Dixie Mission. The American officers saw a well-fed and self-confident communist army. They were impressed. Treated to some Yan'an-style culture, the American newspaper reporters liked what they saw, too. The New York Times ran a headline, Yan'an, a Chinese wonderland city. By the time the Americans left Yan'an, most were convinced the communists were better partners than Chiang Kai-shek. Less corrupt, more united, more used to the Allies against Japan. The reopening of the Burma Road early in 1945 was a symbolic step towards victory. Thousands of laborers had worked to repair the vital supply lifeline to the south. And in August, a surprise for war correspondent William Pung. We were just about to fall asleep when we suddenly heard the sound of guns. There were American soldiers everywhere. US Army. US Army. They were firing their guns into the air, drinking beer, eating rations out of cans. They were very happy. We asked them what had happened. The Japanese are finished. 
So the Japanese had surrendered. We had no idea. It wasn't until we saw the Americans celebrating that we found out the Japanese had surrendered. Japan was defeated, but China was not at peace. U.S. General George C. Marshall's mission, the unification of China by peaceful democratic methods. He did arrange a ceasefire and he did get an agreement drawn up signed by Jiang Chun for the nationalists and by Zhou Enlai for the communists. All smiles for the camera. But the communists had ended World War II as masters of a huge area of 95 million people. In Yan'an, they were ready to turn 10 years of dress rehearsal into real victory. Undisputed leader of the party was Mao Zedong. He was already a cult figure. A comrade said of him, Chairman Mao is the savior of the Chinese people, the shining light of the workers and peasants, the banner of the broad laboring masses. The civil war, which now engulfed his country, reached Jian'an in March 1947. As the nationalist bombers flew overhead, shopkeeper Wang Sezhe did the same as everyone else living in New Market Street. New Market was thriving. So when the nationalists came, we were terrified. Some people took their belongings with them, others never had the time. Only a minority of people didn't go. Most did. They all fled to the villages, ran into the gullies, hid in the caves. They were scared. I took my wife and children and fled. The goods in the shops were still on display. The nationalists seized everything took everything away. In bitter cold, they abandoned Yan'an to the enemy without a shot fired. Chairman Mao and his army took to the hills, returning to the guerrilla tactics they knew so well. Mao told his comrades, our policy is to keep the enemy on the run, to tire him out, then look for an opportunity to destroy him. Mao himself went underground with a new alias, Li Dushun. It means determined to be victorious. Yan'an was an empty victory for the nationalists. Their army was overextended, their bureaucracy hopelessly corrupt. Later, Mao wrote this poem. We were resolute. We were ready to die. We dared command the sun and moon to bring a new day. A revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery, Mao wrote. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. Mao cut the cloth of European Marxism into new Chinese shapes. He relied on peasant support. In the weeks after they were chased out of Yan'an by the nationalists, Mao and the Red Army took refuge in the hills to plan the coming battles. In this valley, Zhou Enlai organized a massive meeting attended by peasant militiamen Lei Jifu. I don't remember exactly what he said, but the gist of it was, elders of the border region, comrades. Chairman Mao is still in northern Shaanxi. They'll fight with us and triumph with us. When we heard that Chairman Mao was still here, we all clapped vigorously. The Premier said, Chairman Mao has already told us that the War of Liberation will last another three years at most, maybe just over two years. We must liberate the whole country, advance to Nanjing and capture Chiang Kai-shek. Oh, when we heard that, we were overjoyed and clapped vigorously. 
They march past four abreast, foot soldiers, machine gunners, artillery. Oh, when we saw how large Chairman Mao's army was, the older villagers said, there's hope for the revolution. The communist counterattack had begun from the far northeast. Their People's Liberation Army were no longer guerrillas, but a powerful conventional force. Half a million men took one Manchurian city after another. The fall of Mukden in September 1948 brought the rich industrial heartland of northeast China into communist hands. The military victories were supported by attractive communist policies. Mao made sure that as the Red Army advanced, it took his best ideas with it. Most important was land reform. Landlords were dispossessed and their property shared out between poorer peasants. This was wildly popular among the beneficiaries. We would say to the landlords, this is revolution. You've got plenty to eat and drink at home, but a lot of us ordinary folk have nothing. That's why we want to carry out this land reform. We had all sorts of reasons backed up by central government policy. I'd take the document outlining the land reform law and explain it to them. Whether they'd listen or not was another matter. The new law was followed by the public trials of prosperous farmers accused of crimes against the poor. This was called speak bitterness. The oppressed were encouraged to talk openly about their miserable lives. There were terrible excesses. By the end, a million may have died at the hands of angry mobs or zealous party officials. The popularity of the land reform swelled the ranks of the Red Army. Peasant sons marched off to war, their lessons in reading, writing and politics strapped to their backs. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, said Chairman Mao. Our principle is that the party commands the gun. China tore itself apart. Villages passed from nationalist to communist and back again. In some areas, returning nationalists shot dead one member of every household that had taken part in the land reform, or buried alive peasant leaders and their families. Increasingly confident, the Reds flew kites inviting the enemy to surrender. They offered food, shelter and certain victory. In four years, from June 1946, the communists claim more than six million nationalist soldiers were captured or gave themselves up. All had to be fed and clothed. That challenge was met by a future Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping. Deng and his comrades had learned a lot in Yan'an. They were skilled in raising help and commitment from country people. Their organization, was superb. Tianjin, 80 miles north of Beijing, January 1948. The communists sent New Year cards into the city. We wish you a long life and a prosperous business. 
If we should take the city in this new year, do not be alarmed. We shall restore order quickly and welcome your business. Tianjin fell. More prisoners were taken. The nationalists were in full retreat. Mao's troops entered Beijing on January the 31st, 1949. They rode into the old imperial capital on American tanks captured from Chiang Kai-shek's doomed armies. On October the 1st in Tiananmen Square, China's new rulers claimed their victory at the Gate of Heavenly Peace. Run Yuan was there. <laughs> Our group from the Ministry of Railways stood there just below those words at the foot of the rostrum. Those words, long live the unity of the peoples of the world. I could see every movement, every silhouette on the rostrum very clearly. The atmosphere was unforgettable. It was after Commander-in-Chief Zhu had inspected the troops that Chairman Mao proclaimed, today marks the founding of the Central People's Government of the People's Republic of China. At that moment, the whole square was filled with the sound of drums and a sea of flags. We thought then that it hadn't been easy for the Chinese people to stand up. From down below, I looked up at the rostrum and looked in the direction of the memorial. And I thought of when I was on the battlefield, and I remembered my fellow soldiers who'd given their lives. I thought this victory was made possible by their sacrifice. It hasn't been an easy victory. We must continue their revolutionary testament and dedicate our lives to the building of new China. Mao set off on his first ever foreign trip. To Moscow. It was Joseph Stalin's 70th birthday. The Bolshoi Theater. At Stalin's right hand stood Mao Zedong, newest symbol of the forward march of world communism. They celebrated Stalin's birthday in China too. While Mao was trying to negotiate economic help from the Soviets, Judah was taking delivery of Stalin's presents. But in 10 weeks in Moscow, the Chinese delegation got hardly anything out of Stalin. He didn't like Mao. He called him a margarine Marxist. Long live comrade Stalin. So the fascination with Soviet culture was short-lived. The Chinese never got the material help from the Russians that they wanted. They had to look for Chinese solutions to Chinese problems. Hold fast to the way of antiquity, say the Taoists, to keep in control the realm of today. For a hundred years, reformers had been battling against tradition in China, but the communists were determined to drag their new domain into the modern age. They started with the women. 
women like Su Shuang Tian, her feet bound and crippled, to win her a husband to whom she owed total obedience. They were bound when I was six years old. It didn't hurt. My mother bound them. Why did she do it? They look pretty like that. Small feet look nice. Now they look terrible. But then, nobody wanted you if you had big feet. <laughs> On our wedding day, he came to fetch me in a sedan chair. We had a sedan chair each, those decorated sedan chairs. I wore a pearl headdress and a robe with dragons embroidered on it, and there was a belt. Two people supported me as I stepped off the sedan chair, and everyone clapped because I had such small feet. If you had big feet, people wouldn't even bother to look. They'd go away. How sad it is to be a woman. Nothing on earth is held so cheap. Boys stand leaning at the door, like gods fallen out of heaven. Their hearts brave the four oceans, the wind and dust of a thousand miles. No one is glad when a girl is born. By her, the family sets no store. A third century poet, a 20th century solution to free Chinese women from the symbolic slavery of the bridal sedan chair. The marriage law of 1950 was one of the party's first acts. It was accompanied by a huge propaganda campaign, extolling the virtues of a modern marriage based on freedom of choice and equal rights. Confucius said, women are as different from men as earth is from heaven. Mao Zedong said, women hold up half the sky. Modern notions imposed on an ancient belief system. The marriage law was not universally popular. Some country people called it the women's law. They said it was an unequal treaty against the men. There was a fierce backlash, but there was no stopping millions of women. Tuo Jen was free of her Confucian duty to obey father, husband, and sons. I tell you about my father. In those days, my father smoked opium. He loved his opium. He smoked until he had no money left, so he had no choice. He gave me away. When the Communist Party came, people said that men and women were free to choose their own partners. If you didn't like the other person, you could choose not to have him. You didn't have to say, oh, I couldn't do that. You just followed what the Communist Party said and left. You left. He didn't want me to go, but I didn't like him. So it didn't matter whether or not he let me go. I just got up and went. Marriage is nothing but a dream of slavery in another form, declared the young woman who became the first female train driver in China. These images of liberation were driven home. The reforms were accompanied by stifling ideological uniformity. The plain blue cotton costume worn by men and women was called the Yan'an style of dress. It was a visible effort to maintain revolutionary purity. In New China, opposition was crushed, and not everyone found that attractive. In Korea, Operation Comeback begins. Away from the barbed wire compounds where they have lived for many months, 22 and a half thousand Chinese and North Korean troops take the winding road to freedom. China had lost almost a million men in the three-year conflict in Korea. In 1954, these thousands of disaffected Chinese prisoners of war were shipped off by their American captors and allowed to join the remnants of Chiang Kai-shek's defeated nationalists in Taiwan. The communists were furious. US imperialists are paper tigers, Mao proclaimed.
The Cold War helped to encourage the most fervent patriotism. Schoolchildren sang the new national anthem every day. The youngest citizens of New China threw themselves into the great adventure of freeing their country from weakness and poverty. The cry was, away with all pests. Stephen Lau was 10 years old. At that time, we had to, in the morning, deliver a box, matchbox full of uh, dead flies because we were asked to kill flies, mosquitoes, cockroach, rats, and even birds, uh, sparrows. The whole nation got up early in the morning and just make a lot of noise. Bang the whatever, the metal, uh, drum, uh, that you can, anything that you can put your hand on, just make a lot of noise. The theory being that birds would be frightened and they don't have a place to land. They have to keep on flying because the noise everywhere is not from one village, it's every village, every city. So the birds have no place to rest, they just have to carry on flying. And after a while, they are exhausted and they drop dead. Mao described the Chinese people as poor and blank. This may seem like a bad thing, he said, but it is really a good thing. Poor people want change, want to do things, want revolution. A clean sheet of paper has no blotches, so the newest and most beautiful words can be written on it. The newest and most beautiful pictures can be painted on it. The sparrows were later rehabilitated because in their absence, the paddy fields were plagued with caterpillars. We did it in good faith, and not only just enjoying it, but actually thinking that we were contributing to this, uh, something to the country, to the nation. And we were, remember that we, at that time, we were about 10 years old. And in school, we had all this indoctrination, learning about uh, doing everything for the country, sacrificing everything for the country, and that's what we were doing. This was a government impatient for change, men who had already achieved miracles. They'd fought for a lifetime to win the prize of ruling one quarter of humankind, and yet 4,000 years of history and culture, Mao said, and we can't compare with a country like Belgium. Their problem was the economy. They had a set of ideas about industrialization, borrowed from the Soviet Union at a time when they were still friends with the Russians. But their big steelworks weren't producing enough. What was needed was a great leap forward. Once again, the whole country was mobilized in a fantastic effort. The goal? to catch up with Britain in 15 years, to build a furnace, gather coal, find scrap iron, smelt their own steel. We had no material to make steel with, no bricks to build furnaces with. In the morning, we rented a bus from the city to bring us here. When we passed Tiananmen, we got everyone to get down and start digging up cobbles from the roadside. Old cobbles. We dug them up and put them on the bus to build our furnace with. We had no iron, so we got everybody to bring their old pots and pans from home. When we started, we were all in high spirits, and we did produce some stuff. But then we conducted tests. We discovered that it was all below standard. It all came apart, so we felt this was a mistake. But then we'd been instructed by the central government, and so we had to follow orders. We had to achieve the impossible, to produce steel on a large scale, to make this our priority. So. We followed blindly, blindly carried out orders.
October 1959, the first 10 years, the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev came to Beijing. The marchers celebrated the great leap forward. Khrushchev remarked sourly, the Chinese are good at inventing catchy phrases. Behind the slogans, a grim reality. Peasants drafted into huge, inefficient communes. Work in the fields neglected to smelt useless steel. Harvest failures. Famine. Ours is an ardent nation, said Mao, now swept by a burning tide. Party member Chin Chuan was one of those who pointed out at the time that the Great Leap Forward was a bad idea. I went to inspect some of the communes. When I came back, I happened to see the chairman, and he asked us to be critical of him. But after I submitted my report, I was labelled a rightist element. Then I was sent to labour in the countryside. I was relieved of all my duties. When I arrived in Anhui, there was nothing to eat. Even the trees had been stripped of their bark. People had nothing to eat but the bark of silver birch trees and willow leaves. We went to the river to gather wild grass. People died everywhere. That year, over 10 million died. So the great leap forward was a great mistake. In the classic Chinese fairy tale about the adventures of the Monkey King, one character says, nothing in the world is difficult. It is only our own thoughts that make things seem so. China's first 10 years of communism bore the unmistakable imprint of the long, hard years in Yan'an. But the gaps between ambition and result, dream and reality, seemed hard to reconcile for the guardians of the Yan'an spirit. Like the long marcher, Zhang Qingyi. We've been told to build socialism. Is this socialism? That's what kept turning in my mind. But I didn't say anything. Was I happy? Of course I wasn't happy. And it wasn't just me. A lot of people weren't happy. During the anti-rightist campaign, I was regarded by village folk as a chief culprit with rightist thinking. They took a book and pen, gathered us all together and said, admit your errors. What have I got to admit, I ask? Confess your errors, of course. I asked, what errors have I committed? I saw that on every wall of the office there was a picture of Chairman Mao. Oh, Chairman Mao, I thought to myself, I have followed you all along. What have I done wrong? What errors have I committed? I felt very bad, very bad. Mao said, the chaos caused was on a grand scale, and I take responsibility. He took a back seat. The Taoists say, he who sustains all the calamities of the country can be the king of the world. Mao didn't stay long in the wilderness. His next call to arms, can we, dare we, cross the pass into socialism.